Okay, welcome everyone to our next lecture on machine learning. We are still in section 11. Section 11 is a bit larger. And um, let me correct the camera a little bit so that it's not perfect yet. So let's do it like that. Okay, so we continue with support vector machines. I didn't update the date, but today is the 17th of November. So let me flip forward to where we were. And I think the last section was was not trivial, right? It was quite interesting to see how to get an optimization problem from like an intuitive classification problem. And then I told you something about this Lagrange multiplier method. And I, I, I tried to explain also why it works. And maybe that was a mistake, because I wasn't very good at explaining it. So for that reason, again, today I will explain you another version of the method of Lagrange multiplier in a nutshell, where I will. Um, omit the stuff that trying to explain why it works, and I'm just trying to explain you the essentials that you need to apply it, to use it yourself, okay? So just simplify it, okay? And it's also simplified, that's good for me too, okay? Then I also understand it much better. Good, so after that we will look at the linearly non-separable case, yeah? Recall that for the formulation we assume that the data is separable in the sense that the two classes can be split by some, by some area where there are no data points. Yeah? That was a simplifying assumption to come up with the optimization problem. Today we will see how we could get rid of this assumption. And then, since you like coding so much, I will do some coding for you too, hopefully. Yeah? So that's always fun. And on the, other, on the other hand, this is filling up quite a bit of time. So I guess we are not getting towards part three, the nonlinear case, yeah? but that's fine for today. If you understand everything today, that's perfect. So we will look at the linearly non-separable case, and it was an exercise to derive the dual for that case. However, I will do it in the lecture, okay, in detail, so you see how to do it, again, as another example. And then in the exercises, there will be a derivation of a dual of yet another version of the support vector machine, okay? So that maybe it's easier for you to see if you see another version of the derivation and then to do it yourself, okay? Good, so far so good, so let's get started. So let me again try to explain the method of Lagrange multiplier. And I basically got rid of a lot of the stuff that I explained to you last time where my knowledge is also a bit shaky, okay? So I only tell you the stuff that I know. And also there are holes, yeah, which I will point out, okay? Maybe one of you knows it better, who took a class in mathematical optimization. So again, nonlinear optimization with equality constraints. So that is the optimization problem, minimize some function where we have some side conditions, okay? So that is the setup. And this is one step more complicated than just minimizing a function f of w. So for minimizing a function f of w, you know, you calculate the derivative, you set it to zero, and you solve for w, right? And now the idea of this Lagrangian method is that now you have equality constraints, and how can we now derive a problem where we have a similar setup, where we have, how can we get rid of the constraints so that we can apply our knowledge about setting the gradient to zero, okay? And that is the method of Lagrange multiplier. So, however, before doing that and deriving a dual problem, let me first mention option one for solving this problem, and that is plug it directly into a solver. So don't worry about all these Lagrangian dual and so on and so forth stuff. Just write down the optimization problem and match it against some code that you have. Match it against quadproc, for example. And I will show you today how to do this for the um, separable case of the linear SVM. I will program it for you. How to plug it in directly into the solver. So that's option one. And now comes the more lengthy method of Lagrange multiplier, how to do it there. There, first of all, we transform this problem into an unconstrained problem, yeah, by defining the Lagrangian function. So and what is the price to pay to get rid of the constraints here? We get new variables. So before we had an optimization problem in W, and now we have an optimization problem in W and beta. And even worse, so this optimization problem was minimizing in W, and this optimization problem is not really minimizing the whole thing, but it's minimizing in W and it's maximizing in beta. So in principle now we are looking for a settle point, yeah, a Sattelpunkt in German, okay? Which is 
Yeah, it is also something where we can apply our knowledge about derivatives, right? A saddle point also has derivative being equal to zero for both of them. But then to find out whether minimum and maximum, we would look at the Hessian. But it doesn't get this complicated for us, okay? So this is typically the first step if your task is to derive a dual formulation for an optimization problem. You write down the Lagrangian and you do it fully mechanically. For each equality constraint, you introduce a new variable beta i. Since they are indexed by i, I'm also indexing here my multipliers by i, okay? And you add these terms to it. And then there's some theory about it, why this is a good idea. And I don't tell you about it. There are probably experts on YouTube who can tell you much better why this is a good idea. However, practically how we go on now is, having written down this one, we can write out the dual problem in full generality, which is now this max-min thing. So in a way, this insight is a new objective function. However, it's one that is kind of funnily formulated, right? It has a, a minimum at the front. So it doesn't, it's not a closed form solution. It's an optimization problem itself. However, sometimes we can even eliminate the W in this expression yeah, by taking the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to W and setting it to zero. And that's what we do for the support vector machine. For the support vector machine, we take the derivative of this guy with respect to W, we plug it back into this one, and then we have a closed form solution for this inner expression, which is marked blue here. And then we have a maximization problem in beta, okay? And that is our dual problem. So that is basically the two options. Either solve it directly, or you derive the dual problem. And those two options are, um, yeah, two possibilities where one of them might be easier or might have better properties. I have an overview slide which is comparing the two solutions for the SVM, and I give you some hints, okay, how, how to choose which to solve. Good. After that, you also plug it into a solver, right? Once you have an expression for this, this, for this one here, for the blue one, yeah, then you can also just read off like the matrices and some vector and some stuff, and you plug it into quadprog. So this is the method of Lagrange multiplier. One step more general, let's assume there are also inequality constraints here, okay? And this is often also called the method of Lagrange multiplier. However, a bit more precise, or at least Wikipedia precises that this is the method of the KKT multiplier, which is a generalization of the Lagrange multiplier. So it's the same thing, but now additionally we have these inequality constraints here. And for those, we also need multipliers. Again, option one stays, right? So if we have some very powerful solver for setups like this, we plug it in into these methods. And possibly we need to provide code. We write a little Python function for f, we write a little Python function for g and for h, and then we pass these functions to the solver and the solver will call it as it wants it. Or maybe it wants to have the gradient of these things or maybe the Hessian or whatever. Yeah, you've seen it in this interior point method last time, what might be required to implement. So let's look at option two. This is now completely analogous to the Lagrange multiplier and sometimes these are also called Lagrange multipliers. So maybe I'm overdoing it here, but from Wikipedia it says those are the KKT multiplier. And who's KKT? That's Karush Kuhn Tucker. And um, it refers to the authors Kuhn and Tucker um, were the ones who were showing that this method, uh, were introducing the method, I think, in a paper from 1951. And it became very popular after that paper. However, there's also a master student, Karouche, and he wrote his master thesis in 1939 or 1940 or something. So Wikipedia knows the right date. And in this master thesis, he was already deriving everything. So that's why they are called KKT conditions. Actually, that's an interesting debate also in machine learning. Who gets credit for what? Does the last inventor of a method get all the credit? Or should the first inventor of a method get all the credits, right? Sometimes things are reinvented several times. Now, who should get the credit, right? So that's an interesting question. And there's a discussion, especially in deep learning, about it, right? As you know, there was a Turing Award. And then there are other people very important in the field um, like Jürgen Schmidhuber, who didn't got the reward, but which, who also did a lot of research in that area and who might be also eligible for such a prize. So Google the names and you find the ongoing debate here. Yeah, so, and I think the, the final thing is, you should cite all the people who done the same stuff 
that you did before, right? And if your original paper got very famous and you didn't know about the other methods, but then later on you know about them, then please cite them later on, right? And be generous with giving credit to other people. It doesn't uh, lower your impact that you had on the field with your super influential paper. It's just <coughs> important for the history of science to see where the ideas popped up, kind of, right? And who was first, right? Nonetheless, if you come second and you reinvented it, that's also a great contribution, no question about it. Good, anyway, so that's the KKT, where the KKT comes from. So there's a little story behind it. Um, so basically, it's the same as before, like the Lagrangian function. Now we have the generalized Lagrangian function, where we now introduced further multipliers for the inequality constraints here as well. And basically, now here we have a plus sign as well. That's where we need to be careful with these inequalities. We have a plus sign over here if we have here the less than or equal to zero, which looks a bit unnatural to be less than or equal to zero, right? But if we would have a greater or equal to zero, we would have a minus sign at this location for everything to work. And now what is this everything to work? That is a theory that I sketched last time, okay? So when you go through why it works, you will find out that the sign is important, okay? Then again, we can just write out the dual problem where we have an unresolved expression over here. This is our new objective function. And if we can get a nice expression for that one, for this minimization problem, then we are fine and we can just plug it into a solver. And to get this nice expression, what you do, again, you calculate the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the w, which are your primal variables. So if you have several primal variables, you have to take the derivative with all the primal variables, set it to zero, and then you plug it back into the Lagrangian, okay? And then you get rid of this min w. And this is the more general method, sometimes also called method of Lagrange multiplier, okay? And this is now a very powerful tool to have in, in, your, in your toolbox, right? First of all, the first powerful tool is to know that this is a very important problem for numerical people, and they have nice solutions to that. It's like having whatever, quicksort as a library function. You have a library function for solving something sophisticated like that. And the second one is to be able to derive a dual problem of your optimization problem, which sometimes is easier to solve. And so those are really two very powerful um, uh, things that you should be able to do. Also be aware there are many other optimization problems that the numerics people are considering. There's mixed integer programming you've just seen in the seminar and some other sophisticated ones where people worked out powerful methods and if you can translate your machine learning problem into one of those methods, it's like it's solved, okay? Then you can just run the code. Good, so this was last time the separable case, yeah? So we are given some data and we have a primal problem which we derived from some intuition, right? About maximizing the margin, that's where we got it. And then by writing this with a Lagrangian, and doing some things on the board. I showed you last time that we can derive a dual problem. And now you can pick either of them. So both can be implemented using quadprog. Okay, and let's see. No, I don't still have the trade-off, but let's look at it. So here's the variable w. is basically the dimensionality of the data, right? You take the inner product with x. So if x is a 10-dimensional vector, then the w you're optimizing over is like 10-dimensional, okay? And how many constraints do we have? For every data point here, we have a constraint. Uh, by the way, the xi here is wrong, so the xi is not there. So let's put my cursor there. So the xi is wrong at this look. It's from, from the next stuff we will derive. So we have, to, we have now d plus one variables to optimize over, and we have n constraints. And now this can be compared to um, optimizing on the right-hand side, where we have n variables. Okay, because we have for every data point one alpha, and we have also n simple constraints. So this is a so-called box constraint. So this is just like the variable should be greater or equal to something or smaller or equal to something. Okay, that's a very particularly simple constraint. And a simple linear constraint, which is also very well behaved. So suppose now uh, you have 100 data points, but the dimensionality of your data is 1,000, Okay, in that case, you might want to solve the dual problem, right? Because it's cheaper, yeah? So that's how you choose it. It will turn out for the nonlinear support vector machine that we will always use a dual problem, right? Because we can replace the inner product here by a kernel function, okay? This is a preview for next time. 
So the dual problem and the primal problem are two possible solutions, and depending on the situation, you pick one of them. But both of them are fine. So let me show you how to implement this primal problem here. Okay? And your task in the exercise will be to implement the primal problem for the non-separable case, okay? which I show you after this one. So let's see how we can implement this. So again, this is the, um, the code from last time. Um, and there should be some, something missing in here. So let's see where we are. Um, down here. Separable case, implementing the primal problem. OK, so this is my code here. Let me try to make it larger. Yeah, it works. Uh, maybe not that large. So. Uh, OK, so this is good. So I want to implement a function that takes data, typically training data, x and y. And then at the end, it should return the w and the b. OK? The implementation that we've seen so far was with writing an optimization problem in terms of the alpha. That was the implementation of the dual. Now let's directly implement it. So let's directly use the quad proc function. Okay? So for that, um, let's flip back through the slides to this formulation of this quad proc stuff. So where is it? So where's the quad proc? So this is a quad proc thing. Okay? Let me copy it to the board. And then let's derive a value for q, a value for c, and for all the other stuff that we need. OK? So, okay, so let's see. How do we do it? OK, maybe let me first write down the, um, the primal problem we want to optimize. OK? So the primal problem we want to optimize is um, minimize over w and b. And we are minimizing a half the norm of w, which I write like this, OK, plus nothing, and subject to that all constraints should be fulfilled. So all data should be classified correctly, which corresponds to inner product of my data point with my weight vector plus offset. And then I use a trick with putting the label in front so that I say this should be always greater or equal to 1, OK? So this is my primal optimization problem. Now comes the quadratic programming thing. So the quadratic programming thingy, let's see what it is. So it's, I think it's not on the video now, but I wrote it, write it on the board. It's minimizing. Now the letter here I'm using is an x, OK, of a half x transpose q times x, and then I guess plus c transpose x. Everything's still right? Yes. And then we have side conditions, which is a times x is, is it less than or equal or equal? Less than or equal to b. And we have another matrix a for equality constraint, such that we say this is equal to b equality constraint. And furthermore, we have some lower bound for x. OK? so. OK, so that is the setup, basically, of the quad proc function. And now we just need to match this thing into that one, OK? So first of all, note, um, I think we don't, first of all, we need to figure out, so what is x? OK, that's the first question. So the x will be the w and the b stacked on top of each other, OK? So let's write it down. It will be w and b, and that is the vector r to the d plus 1, OK? There's one element. Again, don't be confused. This is really just stacking a vector and a scalar, OK? But I think that should be fine. OK, then let's observe. So there's no term um, where we have a linear thing here. So the c is just a 0 vector, OK? But let's be a bit more precise. So what dimensionality should it have? It should be a d-dimensional 0 ve vector. So let's use this notation here, 0 sub d. OK, it's a d-dimensional column vector, which is completely 0. So by choosing that one, we are ignoring that part. So what about the q? So the 1 half is great. And what about that one? So for this now, we need to write it out with our x up here. So we will have something like w 
transpose. So this is now my x transpose. OK, I just transpose it. And when you transpose it, you transpose the ingredients of it times now my matrix Q, which I need to figure out, OK? And then W and B. So, and I want to have it in such a way that is exactly the norm of the W. OK, any suggestions from your side? OK. Very good. OK, so the short way to write it would be identity matrix. Then here's a 0, and here's a 0 of dimensionality D. OK, where this is a transpose 0 vector, right? It should be a, a, a vector of rows. And in the corner, we also have a 0. Let's write this out, OK? So that is the implementation already. Very good. So we can use that one for the implementation. So where's my eraser here? I don't have one, OK? Another way to write it would be 1, dot, 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 1, and then there's a 0. And then the rest is 0, and the off-diagonal ones are 0. So now, and if you look at it, what's happening here is basically the w terms, they get they get exposed to the ones, and the b term has in its row and in its column basically only zero. So that thing is ignored. Okay? So this, if you do this, it turns out that that is exactly the same as this one over here. We can also use the other notation and just apply matrix vector multiplication to see this. So again, let's use this one. So if you want to do made, uh, like row times column, you have to make sure that the stuff that gets like hit has the same dimensionality, right? So if those are all scalars, those entries must be all scalars. If this is a scalar, then the last thing should also be only one row. If this is a vector, then the number of entries here should match the number of entries over here, OK? And then we can just do row times column, row times column. So let's do that. That is row times column, uh, so which is wt gets hit by the identity, plus the b gets hit by the zero vector. OK, this is just row times column. That is the first entry. What about the second entry? It's like row times column, so it will be w transpose times 0d plus b times 0. OK? And what remains is the w and the b. So far, so good, right? Let's look at the dimensionalities again. So this thing here is a row vector times a matrix. It's again a row vector of the same size. This thing here is a row vector of zeros. This thing here is a a scalar, right? It's the inner product of a, of a row vector times a column vector. And this is a scalar by a scalar. OK, so this entry is a scalar, which matches very nicely the b here. And this entry is a vector, which matches very nicely the w over there. So multiplying with the identity just disappears, right? Multiplying with zeros just remains the zero vector. OK, what about that one? So here I need to erase this sub-index as well, right? Because the scalar product of a 0 vector with some other same size vector is the scalar 0, OK? You want, if you want, you can also put a 1 here. So that's OK. So you could do that. Um, and then the b times 0 is also 0. And 0 plus 0 is 0, OK? So let's get rid of the plus 0 over there. Great. Again, matrix multiplication, row times column. So we get w transposed times w. And we get 0 times b. 0 times b is 0 is w transposed w. OK? I just want to show you why this notation, which looks a bit like, oh, he's overdoing it with these sub-indices, and he's overdoing it with the transpose sign. He has fun about it, but. It's absolutely essential to write it down like this. And then you can really be sure that you're doing the right thing. So you can really elementary compute these things, OK? 
Another way to visualize this multiplication, by the way, would be to write it in this stick notation, okay? So that is one vector, and you multiply it with a matrix like that, and with these sticks, right? And then you can also see that the dimensions all match each other. Why this notation is also nice? Because this kind of operation of stacking a vector we have in our toolboxes, right? We have a vertical stack function and we have a horizontal stack function. And only you have to be a bit careful with stacking a vector with a scalar. So maybe you need to transform it before in a vector in NumPy. But in principle, it's like the, the intuitive thing to do. Good. Very good. So we got our choice here. So the um, Q is exactly this matrix. And let me see whether I have a something to erase. Oh, yeah. Good. Perfect. So let's move on. So we described that already with the Q and the C. Next. Um, we don't have any equality constraints, OK? So let's first deal with those ones. So the equality constraints, so how does it work? So basically, the input is a vector. And then the number of rows of A is telling us how many equality constraints we have, OK? So if we have one equality constraint, the A sub EQ would be a row vector, OK? And then the row vector gets multiplied with the x, and out comes the scalar. OK, so the number of rows of A sub EQ must be equal to the number of rows of the B vector. That means if we don't have any, yeah, then let's assign the A sub EQ just some vector. So in um, PyTorch, I think it would be zeros. Or not PyTorch, I mean NumPy. It would be zeros where I'm now saying I have zero rows. OK. And let's be precise. How many columns do I need? I need as many columns as there are entries in the x. So it's a 0 times d plus 1 matrix. OK? And actually, this object exists in NumPy. So you can, you can create it, and it will have the right shape. And you can use it in a multiplication like that. And the output will be a vector of length 0, okay? which, is, which is nice, so that you can do it. Um, then the BEQ is basically the same thing. So that's now a question of NumPy. I think it's just zeros like this. Yeah? Then you get a, a zero length vector. Yeah? Good. So that was the easy part. OK. So let's get to the inequality now. So what about this inequality? So first of all, we need to rewrite it a little bit. Uh, we need to have it the other way around. So the thing that depends on my input x must be on the less than side, OK? And here we have it the other way around. So let's just flip everything by multiplying with minus, OK? So I flipped it. And now I can read off already my b. Maybe. Uh, not really. Almost. So now I need to reshuffle this. So this thing has not yet the form of the a times x. There's a constant term of the y1 and the b. Ah, but it's not constant, right? So the, let's think about it again. The x is the w and the b, which is here the x and the b. So in principle, this can be written as a matrix vector multiplication. So let's try that. So basically, OK, let's start with the, with the vector b. So the vector b is basically just minus 1s. And now I need to be careful again with the sizes of that one. So how many constraints do I have? as many as I have data points, OK? So that is a ones vector with n, OK? So far, so good. Let's define the matrix A now. And um, so I could write down the solution, but let, let me try to explain you how, how I got to the solution, OK? So basically, now I'm rewriting this expression here. So the minus sign is fine. Uh, I have a, a multiplication with these, or let's start in the inner part. So the inner part is the simplest one. So it's just the vector w transposed 1. OK, so here's some space in here. So it has two entries again. It's a row vector where I put the w in and I put a 1 in. And when I multiply this with the x vector with that one, 
okay? Then I'm getting exactly what I want. Ah, no, I'm not getting exactly what I want. Okay, so let's change this to xi. Let's turn it around. And then we know that, okay, so this must be the xi. And here I want to have the wb. Okay, now this looks already better. And now this is giving me one constraint because this is one row of my matrix, okay? So if I multiply z1 times z1, I will get this expression in here, okay? Now further I need to multiply it with yi, okay? But now I need to get it into some matrix form. So I want to have, for every data point, I want to have one constraint. And there the trick is just, let's forget about the y first, that I can, um, do this several times. Okay, the xi are all column vectors, and I put them as rows into this matrix, and I put a long vector of ones at the end. And if I do a row times column, row times column, row times column, I'm basically calculating this expression for all data points simultaneously. Okay, so if my data matrix is in such a way that basically every row is an example, this would be just capital X times this vector, oh, capital X extended with the ones times this vector, okay? Now, how do I get the yi in front of this? So for this, I need to rescale every row with y. And that is done by using a diagonal matrix where I put the y on the diagonal, okay? And let me show you why this is doing the right thing. So um, what's happening with the matrix if you multiply it with a diagonal matrix from the left. So let's do it once, and then hopefully you believe it. So if I'm doing row times column, yeah, then I'm getting lambda 1, A11. Row times the second column, then I get lambda, lambda 1, A12. And then I'm doing second row times column, I'm getting lambda 2, a21 and lambda 2, A22. So you see, when you multiply a matrix from the left with the diagonal matrix, basically you are rescaling the different rows. Okay? And guess what? If you multiply a diagonal matrix from the right hand side to a matrix, you are rescaling the columns. Okay? This is exactly what we want. We want to rescale each of these rows here with the yi, with the corresponding yi, okay? And then there's a minus sign missing, and that's it. This will be our matrix A, okay? Minus dike of y and then this one. Good. Let's implement it. Hopefully, I do it right. And we call the quad proc function, okay? So... Let's switch to the code. I mean, any questions so far on this one? It takes some practice to vectorize stuff or to matricize stuff, right? But then when you can do it, it's very powerful. It leads, you can get rid of all of your for loops, basically. Your code gets very short, okay? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so it, how is it? Ah, okay. Uh, let me show you again. So, um, so, so your question is, how can xi transpose w plus b? Um, how can this be xi and the one times? W and B. I mean, this is a, a row vector, so let's, it's a, it looks like this, right? So this vector is multiplied with that vector. And then, basically, the dimensions are matching. So the inner dimension of that one is matching. So this can be rewritten as the first element 
So rho times column, this element times that element, and I need to keep the transpose signs, and then that element times the element down here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm trying to define here a clever way, a, a matrix, such that when I evaluate it with W over B, I will get exactly these constraints. Okay. So that's the goal. Yeah, that, that was the, the question, because I thought it resulted from the brackets, but it, it, you only have the results. Yeah, I'm, in a way, I'm reverse engineering the constraints with matrices, mm -hmm. right? So it's kind of a bit cumbersome. Typically, it's easier to start with something like that, and then you do your matrix vector multiplications, and everything will be fine. The other way around is more difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's, that's harder. Um, and similarly, I mean, if this is now getting like a vector because you have x1 and xn, right, this is just a scalar, so I can make, it, make a vector out of it. It corresponds to, so, the column dimension is still 1, and here now I'm having n entries. That means this matrix now here must have n entries, OK? And they will be exactly these ones. OK? Good? So far, so good. I mean, for me, always the amazing thing is, after going through this painful thing on your sheet of paper, you just code it up, call Pratproc, and it works. That's a surprising thing, right? So let's see whether that's really true. OK, so we need to define a couple of matrices. So we need to define our matrix Q, OK? Where Q is basically the I matrix, but of size d plus 1, OK? However, the last element, which is the element d, comma d, must be set to 0. OK, I take the identity matrix one step larger, and I zero the corner element. Hopefully, this is valid NumPy code now here. Then I need the C, and the C is just zeros of 0, comma D. Ah, OK, so we need this dimensionality stuff. So what is the D? So that's basically X shape. So the X that gets fed into this code here when you look through the notebook, it is like that that you have for every data point a row. And so the dimensionality is the number of columns, OK? So it's x shape 2, uh, x shape 1. And the number of data points, so I, I like this notation here, is um, x shape 0. There might be even a better way to write it. But this is like very easy to understand, OK? So n times d. It's the x is an n times d matrix. And then I can use the d over here. I can use the d over there. And I can also use it for the c. So what else do I need? I need the AEQ and the BEQ. However, let's look at the implementation up here of my quad proc. Ah, the scrolling, I need to practice a bit. So where's my quad proc implementation? I think I did it for convenience. That's the default choices. So that is the quad proc. And this is the call. And so if you don't give it a variable, OK, you can give it named variables here. And if you don't give it, it will get exactly initialized in the right manner. OK, so the stuff that I don't want, I can just omit. OK, perfect. So again, let's move down. So where is it? Is it that one? No. Oh, there it is. OK, good. So I only need the stuff. Let's start with the easy one, the B. The b was just um, minus ones of n, OK? And now let's do the a1. So the a1 is basically taking the x matrix and horizontally stacking a ones vector to it. So it's h stack of my matrix x, which has exactly the right shape, is n by d. And I need to put another vector afterwards, a vector that has n rows and one column, OK? So that I need to stack. And this thing gets multiplied by, the, by a diagonal matrix. And again, here I need to make the matrix matrix multiplication. That's why I'm using the add sign. I'm not using Hadamard product. And do I need a sign? Yes, I also need a minus sign in front of it. Good. So far, so good. Then let's call the quad proc. Quad proc. And I think you just call it like this, right? 
I guess A equals A, B equals B, right? So they are named arguments, so I just gave them the same name, and that's fine in Python to do it like that. Okay, how do I get the W? That will be just results X. Take everything until the Dth element, and the B will be results X. Take the Dth element, which is the last one. There are D plus one elements in there, and the last index that I can use is the D. Okay, and hopefully this thing now will work. So let's run it. So this is now calling this function that I just defined. And um, hopefully it's working right away. And we are not lucky, so there's something wrong. So result is equal to quad proc, blah, 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 linear constraint, A being equal to AQ. So what am I doing wrong? For the concatenation matching, blah, blah, blah. OK, let me have a little quick look at the implementation that I already tested. So this is what I just programmed, right? Oh, I see. There's a little problem here. No, there's not a problem. So uh, this is almost the implementation that I just showed you. Hmm, interesting. OK, I used a different D here. So in my implementation here, the X shape was plus 1. So the D is one more. So anyone has an idea what's, what's going wrong here? So let's see. It must be something about the shapes. So let's again check it. So D is really the dimensionality of my data. It's not the D plus 1. I create a matrix which is larger than that, and I set the last element to 0. Great. So what about this one? Ah, OK, so that one needs to be a D plus 1 in this case, right? Because the C is multiplied with W stacked on top of the B. And the W has size D, but the C must have one dimension more. OK? So let's try it again. Value error, great. So what else is wrong? All the input array dimensions for the concatenation axis must match exactly, but along the array, blah, has size 4 and the inner is size 0. Very bad, OK. So I'm just showing you my struggles here, because those will be your struggles when you are doing it at home, OK? And so it's completely normal to get it wrong and to play around with it. So what's wrong? By the way, you are, of course, free to help me. Um, let's get rid of the C guy. Uh, but I think I had it. Uh, shall we keep it? OK, let's keep it. OK, let's then do the following. The way I debug this typically is that I just print out everything. So let's print out these guys and let's see. So this looks like something reasonable. The A is, is giving me some nice constraint set. So no insights from that one. Ah, OK, so let's again look at the, at the error message, whether we can understand it. All the input array dimensions for the concatenation must match exactly. So what is concatenated here? Does anybody of you have an idea what's going wrong? Which one? Where do you mean? So where's the? Like size, um, that is the uh, double bracket. So uh, <sighs> the one is two Good point. I don't know if, if it's yours. But, uh, ah no, I have my own version. <laughs> I changed it so that it's that it's allowed to do that. But good point. That that would would have been a possibility. So what am I doing wrong here? So ah okay, maybe the. Um, the C vector, I see. So the C vector must be maybe a column vector. So maybe that, was a, that is a mistake. Since I'm doing C transpose times X, right? So let's hope for the best. Type error. Oh, no. Must return a scalar. Uh -huh, interesting. Uh, OK. So maybe then I need to do it. Let's do it like that. Maybe that makes more sense. OK, so name error. Oh, no. Results not defined. OK, that's good. So that's already something. So we went through the quadfox stuff. 
And we got an accuracy of 1.0, and we got three support vectors, and the whole thing just runs. Perfect. So this is the solution. Great. OK, I'm happy that it worked out, that we didn't spend the rest of the time trying to debug it. OK, so by the way, what I wanted to show you here is basically how to get the implementation from the mass. OK, so how to translate the optimization problem into the quad prop formulation, how to translate that into matrices in NumPy, OK? And then you just plug everything in, and you need to struggle a little bit with the error messages until you get it right. So you need to print out all the intermediate results, or you have to go into quadproc and do some prints until you get the right format, OK? Good. I'm glad it worked. So, OK, so let's move on then. So that took quite a while, but whatever, I think we learned something. So I just showed you how to implement the primal problem. And last time, I showed you, without live programming, how to implement the dual problem. It took me longer than today, OK, last time. Good, so far so good. Um, let's move on. So we were still in this theoretical part. And we are, we are still missing the KKT conditions, which are important. So let me get to that one. But So the KKT conditions are the karush kuhn tucker conditions, OK? But before we get to them, let me briefly explain you what convexity is, OK? And convexity is a property of a function. Yeah, a function f from the reals to the reals is convex, kind of if like the functional value along a straight line can be bounded by the values at the corners, OK? This is most easily understood with an image. So here's the image for the convexity definition. Um, let me erase that one. So here's my function. Let's take this one, and I take two points at x1 and x2. Then I will have certain functional values, right? So those are f of x1, and I have over here f of x2. And now I take some parameter lambda, which is between 1 and 0, and I'm interpolating on the x-axis between x1 and x2. Right by talking about x1 times lambda plus 1 minus lambda times x2. This is also called a convex combination of two numbers or of two vectors. Okay, So basically, by now turning around the lambda, I can move along the x-axis back and forth. Convexity means that the function value that I will reach here, yeah, this one, is smaller than the function value that I would reach by just interpolating between the functional values, OK? By saying, so the functional value up here, so that is lambda times f of x1 plus 1 minus lambda times f of x2, OK? And so basically, by having this inequality, yeah, I'm having like this nice bowl-shaped function. So why convexity is a nice property? Oh, because if I have a local optimum, yeah, one can see that it's already a global optimum. So that's some nice property for optimization. So another notion is concavity, which is just if minus f is convex, then f is concave. OK, it's just the opposite. Curiously, convexity is very similar to linearity, right? I mean, this, is, this looks like the equation for a linearity. If you have equality in here, then a function f would be linear. So that means if a function f is convex and concave, it must be linear, okay? which is kind of curious. So convexity can be seen like a generalization or a relaxation of linearity. Okay? Um, and then there's also Jensen's inequality, which we need at some point. So for convex functions, we can drag out the function that we apply to a random variable, okay? and then we get this inequality. And one can derive it from this property. The other notion is the area above a convex function. Okay, So all the area above this bowl, so basically the content of the bowl, that is also a convex set, where a convex set is a set where if you take two points of the set, then the straight line between the two points is also inside the set. Okay, So this is a short introduction to convexity. So for us optimizers, Convexity is a nice property because it tells us something about optima, right? So if we have a local optimum, which we might reach by gradient descent or whatever, yeah, then we have a global optimum. So 
one phrase which was like 20 years ago, maybe it wasn't popular, but it's, it's a phrase about optimization. So we don't care whether a function is nonlinear, yeah? we only care whether it's convex. Okay? So when we do optimization, the function can be as nonlinear as it wants, at least if we can prove convexity, everything is fine which is a very strong statement in a way, right? Otherwise, you would think maybe, okay, I can maybe minimize parabolas or maybe some other nicely shaped functions, right? And the key property here is convexity. It's not whether it's linear or nonlinear, it's about convexity. So I like that one. So if all our functions f and g are convex and the hi is even something stronger, so the hi is a linear function or a shifted linear function. Shifted linear means can be represented by a matrix and some offset, okay? In that case, we have a strong theorem, which I think, I, it's not mathematically precise how I write it down, but intuitive. So if I have like an optimal point, W star, alpha star, beta star, yeah, for my Lagrangian here, with optimality kind of meaning it's a settled point, okay? Then we have all these conditions, which look like, oh, so many stuff to memorize, but it's all, you all have seen it. So the first one is just the derivatives with respect to the primary variable should be equal to zero. Okay, great. Then the second, the, the other two are basically called primal admissibility, which means this W star fulfills my constraints I want to have fulfilled. And then I have some dual admissibility, which is a side condition of the dual, basically that my multipliers are all positive. And then the only one which is kind of most interesting is the so-called complementary slackness, which is kind of saying that this alpha times my constraint here for the inequality z equal to zero. And that is the one that we use to get a formula for the offset in a support vector machine. Because then we reason, okay, this equation is fulfilled if alpha i is equal to zero, yeah? Those are the non-interesting points. Or if alpha i is greater than zero, then the gi must be equal to zero. And then from that, you can derive a formula for the b, as we will see again today. Good, so those are the KKT conditions. The last one is the most important one for us. Let's get back to the support vector machine. Let's get to the unseparable case. So that was our optimization problem. How can we now relax it? So the non-separable case means some of the constraints will be violated, and there's no choice for a separating hyperplane such that all constraints are fulfilled simultaneously. So there's no so-called feasible solution, which is one that fulfills all constraints, okay? So how can we relax that? And the relaxation works like this. We introduce more variables, the so-called slack variables, and they are called xi, and they should be greater or equal to zero, and we just subtract it from this margin number. So instead of being greater or equal to one, we say, Okay, we allow a few exceptions. Okay, if it's not too expensive, if we have small xi, then that's fine. So what about this being small? So we simultaneously minimize the summation over all xi i. So ideally, all xi i are zero. Okay, then we have a separable problem. However, we are willing to pay some, okay? Of course, now we need a new hyperparameter that trades off the minimization of the norm of w and the summation over here. So if we write it out, we now reach this optimization problem, and that is now the primal problem for the soft margin, okay? So that is the general formulation of the linear SVM. This is a special case. This is a general case. Biggest difference, this doesn't have a hyperparameter. This thing now has a hyperparameter, which needs to be tuned by cross-validation, okay? So, um, it looks more complicated than that one, and your task will be to do exactly what I did on the board, yeah? implement the primal problem with quadproc, okay? So you need to come up with these matrices to translate it into a quadproc formulation. What will we do next now is that we derive the dual of this beast and look at it. And this I will show you in the lecture. It was an exercise, but I thought maybe you need more practice. And then the exercise will be another formulation of the support vector machine, the so-called new SVM, okay, which is also fancy. And the level of difficulty is quite similar. And you can use many tricks from the lecture now. 
OK, so how do we do this? Maybe I should do this on the board now. So basically, we translate this into a Lagrangian, calculate the derivative with respect to our primal variables, and then plug it in, and then keep our fingers crossed that everything disappears, and at the end, we have a nice problem. OK? So by the way, the minimization now is over WB and now some new kit on the block, the Xi vector. So we have more variables than before. So let's move on to the board. Let's hope for the best that I can do it in the remaining time. And I think I need more chalk. So OK, it's already visible. So let's first of all um, just reuse this stuff on the board here. <clears throat> and it took me a while, but actually there's a nice way to write it up. So there's a way such that everything gets really simple, OK? Hopefully this is a promise I can keep. So first of all, let's modify this to be the primal of the non-separable case. So we need a new variable here, the xi, and we add some constant times the summation of i equals 1 plus the xi i. OK, so far so good. Then now here, um, uh, let's first rewrite it in the proper way. So we have 1 minus psi i. OK, that is our constraint now a little bit modified. So we are now relaxed a little bit. And additionally, we have this psi i should be greater or equal to 0. So again, this is an optimization problem. Let's mechanically write down the Lagrangian. OK, so here's the Lagrangian. I think I need to reserve enough space. Is it visible on the screen? Will it be on the video if I start over here? Yeah, yeah OK. So here's a nice L. I need to plug in all the variables. So those are the primal variables. And then for each constraint here, I need now dual variables. OK, and typically we used alphas for those ones. So let's use an alpha for this constraint. And now let's use a beta for this constraint over there. OK, let's write it out. Let's try to be, yeah, let's, let's use the other notation. Let's, let's use this way to write the inner product. So that has some advantages, as we will see in a second, plus c times the summation of the xi i. And now comes all this constraint stuff. And this is always something I need to look up. So what I remember was that there was a minus sign here, but we need to double check it. Um, if there is a minus sign, ah, now there is a plus sign actually in the formulation if we are less than or equal to 0, right? So let's try to arrange that. So we move this part to the other side, and it's giving us a minus 1 and a plus 1, and then we are less than or equal to 0, OK? So far, so good. Um, so I think we have a plus sign here now. But this is something I need to check. So yi, oh, first of all, alpha i. So I have a Lagrange multiplier now for this equation. And then I have yi xiw. And let's use the inner product notation for that one, too plus b. So far, so good. And now inside the constraint, so I need to open a bracket after the alpha i, I have the 1 and the xi i. OK, so far, so good. And now I'm closing the larger bracket over there. OK, fine. Then I need something for this constraint here. Again, let me write it the other way around. So I get a minus xi i. And that means I get a minus summation over the beta i and xi i. OK. So this looks good. However, I think this is wrong. I think this must be a minus sign. However, I'm kind of confused with the reasoning. Why do I need a minus sign there? Anyone knows it? Ah, yeah. OK, I think I know. So let's do it. So why do we need the minus sign over there? So it was less than or equal 1 minus xi i. OK? Let's first flip this sign. And that means multiplying with minus 1. Question? 
and now it's flipped, right? Uh, let's start over with this one, because those are the mistakes which takes the longest when I have already my derivation on the board. So, this is the initial constraint, right? No. Ah, larger. Ah, okay. So you're right. So, okay, so this is the initial constraint. Ha, ah, okay, and I want to move it to the other side. So where do I get the minus sign here? I'm kind of confused. Hmm? I flip it with a minus sign now. Ah, I didn't flip it. Ah, okay, good. Ah, glad. I'm glad it's there. Okay, great. And now I bring it over here. Ah, yes, okay. And then I get plus one minus xi. Great. So, those are the things where you will do mistakes when you do a derivation, okay? So be aware of these steps. Okay, now it's fine, right? So this minus sign is the minus sign over there, then the minus and the minus in front of the one is giving me a plus, and the minus and the plus in front of the xi is giving me a xi. Great. It's always good to watch it with enough eyes. And now to calculate the derivative, Let's first reshuffle the whole stuff a bit. So we do already some pre-work to make our work super simple. Yeah? So for this, notice that here we have this expression here, the summation, yeah? it basically a summation of some inner products. So it's like a linear combination of lots of inner products. So we can drag in the yi into the inner product. I can also drag in the alpha i into the inner product. I can even drag in the summation sign into the inner product. Okay, so let's rewrite this. So this is a half W transposed uh, WW, and then comes the minus in a product of the summation of alpha i, y i, and uh, x i, W. Okay, and now I just need to make sure that I'm dealing with all the other terms. So basically, this thing is not already dealt with. Okay? However, there's still alpha i, y i times this stuff and alpha times that stuff I haven't dealt with. I only dragged in the summation into the inner product. Let's move on with the xi and let's collect all terms for the xi. So the xi has the following terms. So I have a summation over c times xi. What else do I have? I have a minus alpha in front of xi. And I have a minus beta in front of the xi. Okay, and by this I got rid of that term, of that one back here, and of this term over there. Okay, let's do the same for the b. So I get minus summation alpha i y i times b. And this is getting rid of this term. Finally, there's a 1 in here which I need to deal, deal with, and that will be plus summation alpha i. Okay, why did I do it? Because I'm now interested in the derivative of the whole expression with respect to b. And of course, this is a linear function in b, right? So the derivative is this guy here. So it's very simple to read off. In particular, I see when I set this derivative to 0, the b disappears from my Lagrangian. Now the same thing for the xi. The derivative of the xi i thing will be c minus alpha i minus b i. So that is the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to xi i. Again, setting this derivative to 0, this term will disappear as well, okay, which is nice. Then there's the derivative with respect to w. And this is a squared function. So let's do that. So it, let's write it like a gradient style, so of l. So that will be um, basically the derivative of this thing here will be w, right? So it's like w squared, but it's in w. Right? It's just the derivative of this thing, and you can derive it that it will be just a w. <coughs> and the derivative of z1 over there will be just the first entry of my inner product. Yeah, if you have an inner product, 
b and you calculate the gradient with respect to w, it will be a. Okay? So what I get here is minus summation over the i, alpha i, y i, and x i. So if I set that equal to 0, I see I get exactly the same expression like last time. So w is the weighted sum of my training examples. Okay? So that is the first derivative. The second derivative being equal to 0 is z1. So let's write this one down up here. So we have c minus alpha i minus beta i is equal to 0. Um, then we have the summation of the alpha i, y i, being equal to 0. And now, and we have the w being equal to the summation of the alpha i, y i, x i. OK, those are the three derivatives set to 0. If we now plug it back into the Lagrangian, into this form, first of all, notice this thing stays. OK, so we will then get a, a problem, uh, the Lagrangian summation over the alpha i. This one will remain. This term disappears because this is exactly 0. This thing disappears because the factor is exactly 0. And then we have these two kind of ugly terms, but they are not that ugly because we found out that the w is exactly the summation. Yeah? So what we see is w times w minus w times w. Okay, So this is a half this inner product minus once this inner product. So it is just plus a half. Uh, no, minus a half the inner product. So it will be just minus a half the inner product. Okay, This is now a big time saver to write it like this. Of course, I can write it out, the inner product, which gives me the double summation, alpha i, alpha j, y i, y j. And then comes the inner product of x i and x j. Okay? And there we have it. We got rid of our primal variables, which is quite nice. We used already this constraint, so let's forget about it. This thing is a side condition which stays, right? I mean, we had it before as well. What else do we have? We have alpha i is greater than 0, right? It's a Lagrange multiplier. Additionally, we now have this weird thing up here. This thing is new. This is coming from the slack variables, OK? So let's rewrite it. So let's bring the beta to the other side. Then we have c minus alpha i is equal to beta i. And let's see whether we can get rid of the beta i, OK? So we know the beta i is also a Lagrange multiplier. So the beta i is greater or equal to 0, OK? So we know that c minus alpha is greater or equal to 0. So that implies c is greater or equal to alpha i. OK? Great. So we get this. And this is the dual formulation for the separable case. There's always the question, so when are you done? So when can you stop working on the equations? And here now, you can, I think you can stop. You got rid of the beta variables using this trick up here. You got rid of all the primal variables, and you get something nice. Okay? This looks very much like the separable case, right? Can you spot the difference? So what changed? The slack variables look so complicated. How comes that the dual looks so simple? Any ideas where it's changed? Any suggestion? I mean, before we didn't have a, a, a hyperparameter, right? So there wasn't a C. So the only bit that changed is now this additional inequality constraint. That's it. And this is, I find this really amazing, right? So the primal problems, they look so different when you look at them with these slack variables, really complicated and fancy. And then you derive for both of them the dual problem, and they are almost the same, right? This is, this is quite fancy. I, I, I like it, at least. OK, so I mean, any questions about this derivation before I move on? So you also will have to do a derivation like this for the new support vector machine, yeah? where new means the letter new. 
SVM. <coughs> and um, again, why was this calculation so simple? Right? It can be a, whole, a big mess because write down the Lagrangian and then sort the terms according to your primal variables. That's the trick. At this step, it's really simple kind of to figure out which coefficients are in front of the xi i, which coefficients are in front of the b, which coefficients are of yet other variables that are in the new SVM. There's another variable called rho. And then the derivative of this guy gets really simple because it's just a linear function of xi i. Yeah? Everything gets then very simple. The other thing is not to out multiply this too early, but to keep it written like that, because then you can also just read off the derivatives, and you can just plug in the solution. And the same will happen for the new SVM, but there's one twist, okay? Which you will figure out. Okay, and then you have this thing with eliminating the beta, so that was like the, the extra cherry on top of the cake, okay? Good, so I wrote it up also in the slides here, so here's basically the same trick written out for you. And here are the derivatives. I tell you how to plug everything in here. And also, here's the trick with eliminating the dual variables. So it's all on the slides as well. OK, so you can look it up. And finally, we end up with a dual problem for the non-separable case. OK? So brief summary, what we found. So starting with these slack variables, right, which relaxed our problems, as this is coming again from our intuition about pattern recognition, how to do it right, OK? which looks a bit disappointing, a bit complicated over here, but then surprisingly the dual problem is really simple, where the only difference here is a c greater or equal, okay? So that is really surprising. I think it's, it's almost magic. I think your task on the exercises will be to implement the primal problem directly, okay? Which is a bit messy, right? Why is it messy? Because you have to optimize over wb and xi, so you need to stack these things on top of each other. So the quad proc wants to uh, calculate one single vector, and you need to chop it into pieces. One piece is the w, one piece is the b, and another piece is the xi, okay? So that will be your task, okay? Good, so far so good. Again, this is always very nice, but if we solve the dual problem, of course, how do we get to the w and the b? Where the w is quite simple, right? You just take the weighted average, of your training examples, okay? Um, but what about the B? So for this now, we need the complementary KKT conditions, okay? So these um, complementary slackness conditions from the KKT. So what was it? I wrote it out for the um, SVM problem. So basically, it's like the Lagrange multiplier, KKT multiplier times your constraints. And the product of these two is equal to zero. And this statement typically says either the thing is, this, the, the, the blue stuff here is kind of greater than zero, or less than, really less than zero, and then the alpha i must be equal to zero, or if the alpha i is larger, yeah, then the other thing must be equal to zero. Okay, and this is always the same from where you then can derive a formula for the b. However, now it's a bit more complicated since we also have the xi here, right? So there are some individual skies. So we need to very carefully select now the support vectors that are used for calculating the b. There's another um, complementary slackness condition. We had the other variables, these xi also as primal variables, so there are these equations as well. Beta i times xi i is also equal to zero. So let's remove the beta by plugging in c minus alpha for it, and then we get something to work with. So, case distinction. Those are the interesting ones. Okay, let's look at it. Why these are the interesting ones. So, if alpha i is between 0 and c, so not the extreme, not at the bound constraints, but some, somewhere in between. Because then, c minus alpha being equal to 0 will imply that the xi must be equal to 0, because c minus alpha is not equal to 0. Okay? So, we know xi i is equal to 0, which is great because we can plug it into this condition up here. So this expression must be equal to zero because the alpha i is greater than zero, then this must be equal to zero, and we know the xi i is equal to zero. Yeah? So for that reason, we know that under the condition that the alpha i is between zero and c, we have exactly hit the boundary condition here. So we exactly hit the one in here, okay? 
And that's great because we can use it to calculate the offset B. So calculating the offset means collect all support vectors where the alpha i is less than c, and then you can average the b for them. There are other cases which I briefly go through, so you can have different reasoning here, the alpha i being equal to 0. Those are data points that lie outside the margin, so they are like on the right side of everything. And then there's the one where alpha i is equal to c. Those are the ones which lie inside the margin. So those are the ones that are violating our constraint. Those are the ones where we have psi i greater than 0. Okay? So there are these three groups. So now, who's called a support vector? So if alpha i is greater than 0, then the i x i is a support vector. So those are support vectors, and the third case are support vectors. However, for calculating the b, we should only use the one where we have alpha i is also less than c because otherwise we cannot read off the right b, because there might be a 1 minus xi over here. Okay, So far so good. The good thing is, it's basically the same story as last time, and you see it again, but now additionally with the xi. So practically it means we pick basically the alpha i yeah, that are between c and 0, and for those, again, we can calculate the bi, and then we average over them. Okay, So that's the story. However, be careful, this set S now, how I wrote it here, I didn't wrote it that way, but are, are just those vectors. Okay, so you need to be careful not to include the ones which are inside the margin, but only the ones that are exactly on the margin. Okay? This is, um, this is more trivial kind of to see that this is um, the right thing, right? But let's look at it. It's kind of interesting, right? First of all, the alpha i are all positive. And then you have these xi. So basically what we are calculating, we are calculating here weighted average of all our training points. Yeah, we are calculating the mean of them. However, we do it in a clever way. We, we kind of change the sign by the class label. So the xi's in class 1 get a plus 1 multiplied, and the xi in class minus 1 get a minus 1 multiplied, so they are pointing in the opposite direction. And then we are calculating a mean. However, the mean is weighted by the alpha i. So if your alpha i is exactly on the margin, you get some interesting weight. If you are outside of the margin, you are ignored. Okay? Then you are not taken into account to calculate the orientation of your plane. If you are inside the margin, your influence is limited by being equal to exactly c. Okay? So the examples which are outliers, which are violating the constraints, their influence is limited. So in a way, this is a robust estimation of this plane here, because you are limiting the influence of outliers, and you are only using the ones that are kind of right on the margin. However, what is an outlier and what is here now the right thing is a hyperparameter c, right? I can take a small c, then I'm not allowing, or then I'm allowing a lot of slack, or I can take a very large c, then I'm not allowing very much slack. Okay, so that's a trade-off. Good, so this is, a, again, writing down the dual solution for the linear SVM. Basically the same stuff as before. The only thing that changed was this c being greater or equal to 0. That's it. The rest stays the same. So now, which one should we solve? The primal or the dual, right? I mean, we can do both. I showed you that you can do it. Let's compare them. So the primal problem here has d plus n plus 1 unknown variables. Okay, and the dual problem has n unknown variables. Okay, so in this case, the dual looks more attractive. Okay, um, we have two times n complicated constraints, um, and on this side, we have two times n simple box constraints. Um, however, it looks like the, the dual problem is much better than the primal problem, but here's a nested for loop hidden, okay? This is a nested for loop. It's a double summation. So this thing will have running time n squared. To calculate all these inner products, you need to calculate the inner products between each data point with each other. So it could be that this thing here will let your runtime explode to calculate that. So if the dimensionality is much larger than the n, then it's worth it. But if the dimensionality is smaller than the n, then it might be better to directly solve the primal problem. Okay? As it turns out, 
when we go nonlinear, we will replace the inner product over here with the kernel function. We do that next time. And for the nonlinear case, the dual problem is the only answer. We cannot do that one anymore because the w might be infinite dimensional. So it could be super large. And then you cannot optimize over it. So which one should you choose? You should check basically this thing. Is d less than n? Yeah, then you choose the primal because then it's cheaper than to calculate these squared matrix over here. If the d is much larger than n, then it's very clear to use the dual, OK? So it's not, there are some cases which I don't cover, right? What is d is equal to n or something, right? So, but, but you see the trade-off that you think about it here. Good, so far so good. Um, that's basically the summary that we've seen. The next question would be, yeah, how do we get the nonlinear SVM? Yeah, that will be next time. But um, I will show you now the missing implementation. So I implemented the primal problem for you without the xi. We have an implementation of the dual problem already from last time for the separable case. Let's do the dual problem for the non-separable case. Okay, and that is really, really, really easy to do. Why is it so easy? because I just need to add this one constraint with my hyperparameter. So how do we do this? So I think there should be some code reserved up here. So let's look at it. OK, so this is my code now. So I have x and y, and I have now a constant c. OK, now I need to implement it. Luckily, I have already an implementation for the dual for the separable case. And that will be my starting point. So let's just copy and paste that one. And then we make the right adjustment. So I just copy this code over here. And I copy it down into the, whoops, what happened? Into the pass. Let's plug it in. And now let's add the upper bound for the alphas. So here's the lower bound, right, which is the lower bound for my um, variables that I'm optimizing. The variables of my quad proc, they will be read out, and they are exactly the alpha. So the result dot x of the quad proc is exactly the alpha that I'm looking for. So the lower bound was 0. So let's add an upper bound. So there's just another variable here. And I can just do it like this. So that's it. Done. OK. So this is going from the separable case to the non-separable case. I'm almost done. L one little thing is missing. I need to make sure that I'm getting the right support vectors. So here I was choosing the support vectors to be alpha being greater than 10 to the minus 15 or something, yeah? so to chop them off from 0. But now I also need to make sure that they are not exactly C, because those are the ones that might have a slack. And they will destroy my estimation of the B. So in this code here now, I will define the support vectors. Uh, here, support vectors are only c less than or equal to alpha less than or equal to 0, uh, but really less than and really greater. So I want to have those. OK, I'm not sure in Python now how I can do it. Can I do it like this? Is it possible? OK, what a pity. Then can I do it like that with AND? Or that should work. OK, good. Let's be also a bit generous here. And let's um, take off the threshold from the C. Let's put a little bit numerical thing there so that it's a bit off the C. OK, good. The rest of the code stays the same. I count the support vectors. I'm mapping them all. And then I'm averaging the one to get the b. OK, so let's run it. Let's run the code and hope for the best. Yes, it worked. Ah, so that wasn't impressive. That is just the iris data set. Um, let's now try to separate here the green one from the red ones, OK, because they are overlapping. So um, let's do a renaming here. So we have a blue class and a red class. Let's do some training and testing split. And then now we run the linear SVM dual. That is the one that we just implemented. And hope for the best, there's no mistake. Oh, there's a mistake. Very bad. 
Okay, so the end is wrong. The what? Ah. Let's do it like this. So you say so like this? Okay, let's let's hope for the best. Ah, okay. So let's see what's happening. Any errors? Yes, errors. The truth value of double errors, okay, so let's try to get this fixed. Maybe I should have practiced this beforehand. I thought it's so simple. You mean like this? Yeah. Hmm. Uh, let's, before I'm, I'm do overdoing it here, okay, it doesn't know it. I have two minutes. Okay, so let me generate a random vector, which I call C, rand n, and it's five times one, okay? Fine. Where is it? There it is. And let's look for C being greater than zero. And that is now a vector of true and false, right? And how can I combine it now, maybe like this, C being greater than 0 0.5? Is that working? Oh, yeah, that works. Okay. So it's a single M percent, okay? Hopefully it works. Okay, let's run it. And did it something? Yes, it did something, and it did something wrong. Okay, great, my implementation is kind of garbage. Okay, what a pity. <laughs> Okay, again, I, of course, have done it before. So uh, here's my implementation of the dual. So I got this one right, right? C times once, that's okay, and I ignored the other one. Okay, fine. So maybe I should just ignore it for now so that we get a result. And then we need to figure it out later, how to do the um, implementation correctly. So for now, let's use the slightly wrong version like this, okay, and but this is not very, not very nice. Okay, but that's how it is. I have to figure it out at home. That's a bit disappointing, but we get a good solution. So this one looks at least quite good. And you see there's some stuff in between here, okay? And the last thing I wanted to show you is, now what happens if I change the hyperparameter, okay? What happens if I change the C? And for this, I show you the result for C equals being 1.0 and C being equal to 0 0.1. Okay, I need to change this to dual. I did some renaming. And here we now see the following. So, okay, here we have a certain width. And if I change the C and make it smaller, that reduces the weight in front of the summation of the xi i. So if the C is smaller, I'm fine with a lot of slag. And that means more stuff goes into the margin, and my margin gets wider. Okay, so in the extreme case, if I would let my C go very, very, very small, I would include every data point into the margin, and as you know, the points in the margin all have alpha i being equal to C. That means the W is just the average of the positive examples minus the average of the negative examples, which is not super wrong, right? But it's also not super interesting, right? Because they're, they could be completely unbalanced or there could be something weird. So the C should be larger and then the margin gets smaller. And then the margin is only influenced by the points that are right next to it. Okay, so that is the intuition about the C. Okay, and the other little mistake, it probably takes me some more time to figure it out, how to do the Boolean comparison right. Okay, so thanks for your attention. That's it for today. Next time we will look at the nonlinear support vector machine. Okay, so see you next Monday.